lot more complex than they expected. In fact, I think they're so complex that they are saying with all their expertise, oh my God, these are compounds produced by living systems. But if they go there, it means they have got the end of the story before the beginning. Right. Because right. what that means is they have discovered life in outer space. And they don't want to say that yet. In our back doors. Of in, exactly, right next door. And they don't want to say that because that, of course, opens up the whole can of worms. Well, how did you get life in comets to give you these compounds when they, they hit the moon? Our scenario, as you know, is that the solar system has been inhabited, colonized by great, great, great ancestors, including the moon. And we are they. And we are they. And when we do these experiments on the moon, we're basically knocking on the door of places where we used to live a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. If you look at the imagery, if you look at the photograph, in fact, if you go to enterprisemission.com and you click on the links I have at the top of the page tonight, it will take you to a photograph that was taken not by Lacrosse, but by the Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Observer Mission, LRO. A few years ago? No, no. On October Recently? 7th. Okay. Yeah. In fact, October 7th, a few hours before President Obama had his star party on the White House lawn. That photograph, if you go to the website, you will see the most astonishing crystalline artificial structures you can imagine. Robin has seen this image. Robin is my number one skeptic for all this. Are you? And she is blown away by what she sees. She nodded, sees. yes, by the way. Yeah, well, you've turned over your mic. Yes, I have. It'll, can't do anything but nod, right. yes. So when you put all this together, I think the lacrosse team is dying to tell us the rest of the story. They have been prohibited from going there. And so today was a kind of a place map. They wanted to do something to keep the, you know, the, the, the rabble at bay until they can figure out how they tell this story. Because as soon as they get into the specifics, there are scientists all over the world who are going to say, oh, my God, those things can't exist there. Where do they come from? And that begins to open the door to all of these possibilities, including the moon used to be inhabited. Is this something that they stumbled into, or do you think they were looking for this? Not the water, but these... I think they, they were looking. Uh, on Enterprise, we have published a two-part uh, article called Smoking Gun. There will be a third part which I didn't have time to generate today because we're getting ready to come down here. But this now is looking like there has been a quiet plan to after decades and decades and decades of obfuscating what's out there. Sure. With the election of this administration, Barack Obama, there appears to be a new sheriff in town. There appears to be folks that are learning things that the previous NASA crowd knew and has taken away. It's like this group of guys has to relearn what the old guys knew and took home with them when they all left the office. Now, that sounds kind of kooky, but if you look at what they've been doing from the beginning, this mission came up out of nowhere. It was piggybacked on another mission. It's very low cost, but it basically is the kind of mission that I would have designed if I had been looking for, A, visual evidence and infrared photographic evidence of ruins, and B, the chemistry of what was left behind by those who once lived there. And this incredible a number of organics that they have released as data, but they haven't tabulated on the graphs any molecules. It's, it's crazy. They, they actually showed two graphs. One was what they actually got, those wavy lines. Then they showed a second one showing a kind of a red line that was the smooth shape of the spectrum if there was nothing there. It was just dirt, just gray, cold dust. Then they showed a third graph where they had matched with their red line the squiggles of the actual lacrosse observations, and they said, we've got some matches, and the reporter said, well, what are they? And Kola Prati said, well, I'm not going to tell you yet. That's amazing. I'm not going to tell you yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've been doing that consistently, and Robin has seen the press conferences where he sat there. He said to a Reuters guy, the two hours after the impact, we were all kind of disappointed that we didn't see anything, and the, the Reuters guy said, well, when you get back to the office, will you know by this afternoon if there, if you've got water? And Kola Prati said, well, probably, but I'm not going to tell you. 
And then a month later, which is today's press conference, we're in the same position. He admitted they've got water, but the real story, Joy, for you and for everybody listening, is all those other organic compounds they're not talking about tonight because I'm betting they are going to be incredibly interesting and rich and complex and probably the product of living biology. Now, when they brought the moon rocks back in the 60s and the early 70s, do you think those rocks showed anything, any organisms, and they just kept it quiet? The Apollo samples were taken near the equator, except for Apollo 15, which was kind of up north near the Apennines. But still, because you're looking at smashed rock brushes, which is basically what happens when meteors hit the surface mm -hmm, and you get mm -hmm. other meteors hitting those meteors, hitting, you know, so it's basically a Pulverized. kibosh, pulverized, yeah. This is pristine in situ measurements at the poles in the dark. Undisturbed. Undisturbed, where nothing has happened for a very long time. So the science we're getting from here is, in fact, much more indicative of the real moon than the few places that we could land with the limited technology of Apollo, you know, 40 years ago. What does this tell you, not about the mission and what we're going to do in the future, but what does this tell you about this universe and what really has been going on? Well, it tells me that we are pursuing the appropriate model, which is that the solar system used to be inhabited by folks that knew a lot more than we do. We are there. A long time ago. A long time ago. We're their dim descendants. We're kind of like the poor cousins. You know, we barely can keep it together on this one planet. Right. And if there are folks out there, which I'm pretty sure there are, you know, the Catholic Church said about a year ago that there are folks out there, and, and, and this one priest, uh, the Jesuit, Dr. Foynes, yes, who's head of their astronomical the Vatican Observatory. Vatican Observatory. He basically said, we must look at them as our brothers and sisters. And I said to Paula Harris, <clears throat> my resident Rome expert, I said, that's not a metaphor. He means that literally. He does. They are our brothers and sisters. Now, this week, the same week that Lacrosse makes the announcement, the Vatican holds its first astrobiology, exobiology uh -huh. conference in, in uh, Italy. And the Vatican officially now, not, you know, her friend, Cardinal, what was his name? Um, Balducci. Balducci. Who passed who is away. no longer with us. He used to say these things kind of like on the QT, but it wasn't official. It's now official. The they're, Vatican they're looking for life. Is look, no, they're looking for aliens. They're looking for extraterrestrials. Right. They're not looking for microbes. Well, and, they're looking for... And Michael Sala says they know that they already exist. Well, of course they do. You know, remember, all these institutions have kind of got together and figured out, a la Brookings, that we can't handle the truth. You know, Jack Nicholson's ghost is coming yep. through the studio. My favorite line. So... You can't handle the truth. Yeah. So we have been prepped. I call it the time-release aspirin model. And you and I exchange emails many times, and I just do drip, drip, drip. Yep. Because it's another part of the... Puzzle. Slowly getting us used to the idea. They're terrified that we're going to freak out you know, as as, Would uh, we? as 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 Bill Murray said in, in Ghostbusters, cats and dogs living together. No, of course not. Most people who are really, really super, um, I want to choose my words carefully here, uh, super religious in the sense that they are looking at texts without deviations, they're not going to be bothered by this at all. No, not at all. Because they live in their own universe. Richard, when we come back, I want to talk about your sci-fi special and uh, whether you think there'll be a follow-up to that. And um, I, I got the impression you think we could be headed for trouble in 2012. So we'll be back in a moment with Richard C. Hoagland on Coast to Coast AM. Well, next hour, it'll be Friday the 13th, open lines. You know, I did not want to fly today. I normally don't on Friday the 13th, but... Had to get to this event at KKOB, so here I am. I'm with Richard C. Hoagland, and we're going to continue talking when we come back a little bit more about the incredible NASA moon crash that struck up lots of water, and then we'll get into a sci-fi special, which is still airing, by the way. I saw it last Sunday. Great show. Back in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. We're with Richard C. Hoagland this hour, live in Albuquerque. Richard Ingo Swan, remote view of the moon, far side claims that there were structures there. 
I guess uh, I'm not going to doubt that. 